And well, last Sunday morning, we concluded our multi-week Bible study series on the life lessons that we can learn from the life of Joseph. And of course, I mentioned that um, the next uh, Bible character study that we will be doing, we're going to jump ahead about 300 some odd years, and we're going to start studying the life of Moses and the life lessons we can learn from him. And uh, because of the fact that during uh, the life of Moses, we're going to be talking about, if you will, mentioning the Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle. Now, I would love to do a study of the Tabernacle that would take about at least eight weeks um, to go through. Um, but one thing is clear about the Tabernacle. It points to Christ Jesus. Um, but we're going to be hearing about it, um, and especially the Ark of the Covenant. So I figured I'd go ahead and at least give a one-week lesson on the Ark of the Covenant. It will be somewhat short. I mean, I could spend several weeks just on the ark all by itself. Um, but um, so this Sunday morning, instead of jumping straight into the life of Joseph, we are going to discuss the ark of the covenant. Now this morning, let's take a look in Exodus chapter 25, verses 10 through 22 to see um, what God says about the ark of the covenant. This is the instructions for the construction, if you will. And God's holy word declares, And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof. And two rings shall be in the one side of it, and the two rings in the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the side of the ark, that the ark may be borne with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark, and they shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. Of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end. And even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things, which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Now, if you don't mind me saying so, in my own humble opinion, I believe that the Ark of the Covenant is one of the most fascinating pieces of the Old Covenant. But I believe that it is also somewhat, shall we say, misunderstood, um, thanks in large part to Holly Weird. Um, of course, the, the most, I'd say, egregious is um, the Ark, uh, what's that, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, that's what it was. Um, I forget that guy's name. Uh, Indiana Jones, that's right. Harrison Ford played Indiana Jones. Um, and they, they use somewhat traditional um, and then uh, mythical concepts for that movie, but um, that's fine. But So it, it's sad that we as Christians don't really know that much about the Ark of the Covenant. Um, so I brought with us a, a, a modern representation, and I will tell you what's wrong with it as we go through. Um, but unfortunately, we have no visual representation of what the actual ark ever looked like. We have artist interpretations, if you will. Um, but the description that God provides in his holy word does not go into specific details enough for us to be able to see what they saw back then. And that's not a bad thing. It's no big deal, as we will understand later um, when we, as I finish up on the study this morning. Um, but uh, the, the question comes up, what is the Ark of the Covenant? Well, the Ark of the Covenant, as in, uh, mentioned in verse 22, if you will, this is uh, where God meets with his people. So I'm going to back up a little bit. The tabernacle was a place where humans were able to commune with God 
And in the Holy of Holies within the tabernacle was the Ark of the Covenant where God communes with his people. He comes down from heaven to dwell between the cherubims. And we used, or they used, if you will, the, I'm not that old, um, Brother Priest may be, but I'm not. Um, but uh, they used the, uh, God used the tabernacle as a place to bring the people to him. It's an amazing concept that we follow today. You see, the church is the equivalent of the tabernacle. We come to here, and God's holy word would be the equivalent of the Ark of the Covenant. But even better so, for those folks who have accepted Christ Jesus as their Savior, the Ark of the Covenant lies within your heart. Because Christ Jesus, as we will see as we go through this, is the Ark of the Covenant for us. Meanwhile, back of the ranch, let's go ahead and take a look um, at the Ark of the Covenant. God's Holy Word references this Ark more than 150 times. It is called the Ark of the Covenant more than 40 times. It is called the Ark of the Testimony more than a dozen times. And it is also called the, called the Ark of the Lord, the Holy Ark, and sometimes just the Ark. But more than, 100, gee, more than 150 times throughout God's Holy Word, we learn about the Ark. It is important to note that in God's instructions for the construction of the tabernacle, the very first item of, shall we call it furniture, uh, mentioned is the Ark of the Covenant. This demonstrates that God considers the Ark of the Covenant to be quite important, more important than the altar of brass, more important than the lava of brass, more important than the table of showbread, more important than the veil, more important than the lampstand of gold, and even more important than the altar of gold. In fact, the Ark of the Covenant is the only item mentioned in the instructions allowed behind the veil in the most holy place, also known as the Holy of Holies. Again, that is how important God considers the Ark of the Covenant. So if God thinks that the Ark of the Covenant is that important, maybe we should too. But all too often, most Christians disregard the Ark of the Covenant as just another piece of boring Old Covenant history. Oh, that's there's nothing important in the Old Covenant for us to study. It's just history. It's boring history. I don't know about y'all. When I went through history in high school and college, I thought it was pretty boring. I slept through it most of the time. True story, I'm turning my hand up. The teacher would prefer I sleep through it because of my answers I'd provide when he asked some silly question. I'd give him you know, a silly answer back. He'd tell me, go back to sleep. And, true story. But um, I find history, um, for the most part, back then I found it to be pretty boring. I've learned since then that even so-called boring history has lessons to be learned, and much of it can be very exciting to learn. And when it comes to the Old Covenant, if you will, history, it's very exciting and full of incredible life lessons for us to learn. And that is certainly also true with the Ark of the Covenant. Now, as I mentioned, and I'm going to interject here, that all modern representations of the Ark of the Covenant are all potentially flawed simply because the biblical instructions leave a certain amount of, shall we say, artistic interpretation. And each individual may interpret the instructions a little differently. In fact, the Ark that I brought with me today has a couple of common potential misinterpretations, which I'll point out as we go through. Um, but meanwhile, back at the Bible Ranch, God instructed Moses, and they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Now, shittim wood comes from the acacia tree and is very durable and resistant to decay. It's a very strong, hard wood. To put that into perspective, anyone familiar with the redwood trees of California? Those are acacia trees. Now, they are extremely durable. You can even build tunnels through them, and the trees still stand and grow, and they're still big enough. That's the type of wood that God commanded for the construction of not just the Ark of the Covenant, but also throughout the, the tabernacle itself. The word shittim also implies being scourged or flogged. Interesting. So as such, shittim wood represents our incorruptible Savior, Christ Jesus, who was wounded for our transgressions. Right off the bat, the very first piece of instruction tells us about Christ Jesus, our Savior. And yet people will sit out there in the pews and say, the Ark of the Covenant's not important to me because I am a New Testament Christian. Well, happy day for you. I am a Bible Christian. 
I believe in the entirety of God's holy word, whether it comes from the Old Covenant or the New Testament. It's all relevant to me as a Christian. It is significant that throughout the construction of the tabernacle, many, if not most, everything is either made of solid gold or overlaid in gold. And here we see in, in the very next verse, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold within and without, thou shalt, uh, shalt thou overlay it. You see, Gold is a symbol of royalty, not just because of its obvious beauty, but also because it is one of the few precious metals that does not corrode. You can dig up a piece of gold from 10,000 years ago if they had it back then, and you know, um, which is a little bit before the, um, the, the actual uh, formation of the earth. But if you can go back that far, which you know, some people think you even go 50 million or billion years back before the earth was even created. But you know, if you can... And, and you found a piece of gold from back then, it would still look the same. It doesn't decay. That is an amazing concept. As such, gold signifies the holiness and eternal nature of God as revealed through Christ Jesus. So the ark being both wood and gold symbolizes how Christ Jesus was both human and God. He came down from his throne in heaven to take on this human flesh so that he could be our ultimate sacrifice. And all the while, he was still 100% God, just as the ark is made of wood overlaid in gold. God then provided some specific instructions as to the size of the ark, as well as its carrying handles. The ark which I brought with me today is obviously a little smaller than the original, which was about 3.75 feet wide and 2.25 feet tall and 2.25 feet deep. So it's a decent size, but um, a little bit bigger than that little thing in front of me. Um, but I don't think I would have been able to carry the, the big one in here, at least not without, you know, I need three more people to carry that one. But anyway... The method for transporting the ark was so specific because according to Numbers chapter 4 and verse 15, the sons of Kohath shall come to bear it, the ark and the rest of the, uh, the tabernacle as well, but they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. And I'm not going to take time to, to go over the story of Uzzah, um, but we know that if you touch it, you die. Now, I'll, I'll give you a clue. This is, so if I do touch it, I don't die, don't worry. Um, just wanted to make sure you all understood that. Um, we're not going to die if you decide you want to look at it later. I don't know what's going on with the sound uh, with my microphone or something, but it doesn't like me this morning. Um, that, that's too bad. I'm going to keep talking regardless of what Satan wants to do. Um, but the Ark of the Covenant is an holy thing. So us low down, no good, dirty, rotten, good for nothing, sinful sinners cannot touch it lest we contaminate it. But rather than contaminate it, we die. That's how holy it is. The ark was carried by two gold-covered wooden poles. However, this ark has a potential misinterpretation. So let's take a look at the instructions here. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold within and without, shalt thou overlay it, and shalt make upon it a crown of, of gold round about. And now when they talk about crown, we're talking about a molding, if you will, along the top sill. And right after that, we continue in verse 12, And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof. And two rings shall be in the one side of it, and two rings in the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, and that the ark may be borne with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it. So the, the, the sticks, they stay there where they're at. But the instruction... Um, and notice in verse 11, God instructed that a crown of gold shall be placed round about it. The Hebrew word translated here as crown implies a border molding along the top of the ark. And you can see they've got that little design, and that's fine. I'm not going to, like I said, this, it doesn't provide specific instructions as to what design you want to put on it. So that's okay. Um, but then immediately in verse 12, God instructed, And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof. And the two rings <coughs> shall be in the one side of it, and the two rings in the other side of it. Now some people have translated the word corners to mean feet. <coughs> At no point did God actually mention creating feet for it. Um, but, you know, as you can see, people like to put feet on it, and that's 
I guess it's okay, um, but that's not really what the word means. But people have implied it to mean feet, so then they place the staves and the rings at the bottom of the ark. Now, anyone here with uh, a little bit of knowledge knows carrying it that way would make it extremely unstable. Now, if you are trying to carry it way up high and you got it on people's shoulders, um, every time there's a little bump in the road, that thing's wobbling and you're scared that it's going to just reach over and touch you and you die. So while that, it sounds like a great interpretation and it looks pretty sitting there, if you do a, a visual, uh, a, an image search online for the art, you will find that various um, people, artists have interpreted as the staves could be right here in the middle or the staves could be at the top. Now, for stability, having the staves higher up makes it easier to carry. And again, you'd have the four people on these corners, and they'd be able to carry it without it tumping over on top of them. And, of course, there are some items on the end that you don't want to fall out. So I, the interpretation here, I believe, is potentially um, flawed, if you will. But again, we have no surviving images of the original, and the instructions are somewhat ambiguous. Now, maybe if I studied Hebrew, I could, you know, figure out a little bit more of it. But um, uh, Strong's helps me out quite a bit on that one. And uh, uh, just as a, a note, I think that the staves probably would have been higher up. That's just me. But the model I bought has it on the bottom, which is fine. I'm not going to, you know, send it back and complain and, and demand my money back. But anyway, the Ark of the Covenant is to have the staves, sticks, poles, whatever you want to call them, remain with it at all times. Does anyone have any idea why that might be? It's a simple concept. Remember, this thing is holy. Now, if you keep pulling them things out and putting them back in, you're going to end up breaking some, or you're going to end up trying to touch it to line it up properly, and now you've, you've done damage where it doesn't need to be done, potentially to yourself. But it also has to be ready to move at God's instruction. Unlike the tabernacle, which had to be set up and torn down, this thing is always ready to go per God's command. There is no waiting around. If God says, move this tabernacle or this ark, we move the ark. Well, I didn't. You know, again, Brother Priest was probably one of those guys. You know, he's with the name of Priest. You know, he was of the Levi tribe, and so he would be responsible for carrying it around uh, and setting everything up. Um, but meanwhile, back at the ranch, the, the next item that we see... Um, you have the main component of the ark, but the next item that we see is actually a totally separate item. But the two are listed together for simplicity, uh, and I'll explain why in a second. But the, God instructed Moses, and thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. So it's the same size as the ark, and there's a reason for it, as we're going to get to in a moment. But this is, if we'll... Uh, it's called the mercy seat, and it was on the mercy seat which the high priest would sprinkle the blood of the sacrificial lamb to atone for the sins of Israel once a year on Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. The mercy seat, that name by itself should you know, um, cause bells to go off in your head. Um, it's something that all Christians should know about, the mercy seat, because the mercy, well, I'll get there in a minute. I, 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 I don't want to jump too far ahead, um, but... According to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 13 through 26, after his resurrection, Christ Jesus entered into the Holy of Holies in heaven and sprinkled his sacred blood on the mercy seat in heaven. So that kind of is a clue as to what we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, but the same mercy seat that you see in front of us, well, not this one, um, but that uh, in the Ark of the Covenant, it's the same one, according to Hebrews, that Christ Jesus sprinkled his sacred blood on after his resurrection. We are all familiar with Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But pay attention to the following two verses, Romans chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. Being justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. The Greek word translated here as propitiation is, in the Greek, the same word used for the mercy seat. Christ Jesus is our mercy seat for the world today. Make no uh, bones about it. The reason God used those words 
is to let us know Christ Jesus is our mercy seat. Next, we find in Exodus chapter 25, verses 18 through 21, God instructed Moses um, to place on top of the mercy seat um, something called the cherubim. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat, and make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. <clears throat> And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark shalt thou put the testimony that I shall give thee. So here we, it's clarified that the mercy seat is the lid of the ark. So it's two separate pieces, but it is the lid, making it one piece if you prefer but God instructed Moses to place two cherubim hammered out of solid gold on either end of the mercy seat. And as represented here, it, there's no instructions as to whether they're standing, laying down, kneeling as these are, whatever. But it simply says that they are on um, the mercy seat and they are covering their wings forward over the mercy seat, facing each other, but looking down towards the mercy seat itself. And it's relatively well represented here, so I can't really complain too much. But we don't, again, the big question is, what is a cherubim? Does anyone have any ideas? But I need you to give me a, a, a book and verse, chapter and verse. We don't really know. Growing up, I was always taught that cherubims are like baby angels. I don't know if any of y'all remember seeing that. The cherubims are always little, cute, baby, you know, plump uh, kind of like Cupid, if you will. Uh, the, the plump baby angels. Uh, I don't know where anyone gets that from because there's nothing in God's holy word actually telling us what the cherubims look like except that we have this. Now, there's some mention in Revelation of other angels, but these are not the seraphim. These don't have, you know, uh, what is it, six, six sets of uh, wings, six wings. Um, they, it doesn't mention anything about all that. Um, but uh, so anything you see as the cherubim itself is artistic interpretation. And so just keep that in mind. You know, having a human-like uh, figure is fine because I don't have anything in God's holy word to tell me what else to, to, to make it out of. So that's a pretty good one. Now, and here the mercy seat is just a round design. Um, we don't know. Uh, there's no instructions that we have to put any specific design there. The entirety of the is the mercy seat, if you will. But then God answered the question already for us. What is the purpose of the Ark of the Covenant? And I mentioned this briefly already, but in Exodus chapter 25, verse 22, God's holy word declares, And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, but from between the two cherubims which are upon the Ark of the Testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. And according to Psalm chapter 99 and verse 1, he sitteth between the cherubims. Now, I, I did a, a word search to see how many times it says, um, he that sitteth between the cherubims, and I don't know, I, apparently I didn't write it down, but it's a lot. Um, God was referred to by the Jews as he who sits between the cherubim. And I like that because they knew that this was where they would go to look for God. We don't have to look for this. We're going to get into that in more detail in a little bit, but we don't have to look towards that to find God. Again, if you have accepted Christ Jesus as your Savior, you only have to look within. And if you haven't found him yet, then look, open up your Bible and look in there. The entirety of God's holy word points to Christ Jesus and our need of salvation. But anyway, let me keep going on. Um, before the Ark of the Covenant, God dwelled with his people in the Shekinah glory. Everyone familiar with the Shekinah glory? It's not always called that. That's a, a, actually a Jewish term that they created for it, and that's fine. I'm okay with that because it's easier to say than the pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. Um, but Israel, and indeed all peoples of the world back then, could see God's presence simply by looking toward the Shekinah glory. And the Shekinah glory both guided the Israelites, and protected God's people through the wilderness from others. 
If you remember, as they're going towards the Red Sea, what was protecting them from between them and the Pharaoh's army? It was the Shekinah glory. God had the Shekinah glory as a very visible um, place that he would dwell with them. Later, he, he dwelt on the, on the mount. But nowadays, we don't really need this. Well, backing up, God figured there's an easier way to do it. <coughs> so he created <coughs> the Ark of the Covenant. Now, this new dwelling place for God, the Ark of the Covenant, again, was where God would speak to the high priest and dwell with his people. The tabernacle was designed, if you will, as a kind of a housing for it to bring the people to God. And God met with them through the, through the Ark of the Covenant. I tell you, like I said, when, when you start studying the tabernacle and, and in more detail with the Ark of the Covenant, if you can't sit there and uh, if you can sit there and not shout glory, hallelujah, amen, then something's wrong with you. This is exciting stuff because, again, we are seeing Christ Jesus prophesied long before anyone knew his name. Well, God knew his name. He even knew his own name, too, by the way. But no one on earth yet even knew the name of Christ Jesus. They knew that there was going to be someone coming. But they didn't even know his name yet, and yet God was telling them all about him through the Ark of the Covenant and the rest of the tabernacle as well. So consider this, though. The Ark of the Covenant was the earthly dwelling place of God with men. But Christ Jesus now dwells within the hearts of men who accept and receive him. As such, there is no need for an Ark of a Covenant because Christ Jesus is our mercy seat and he resides in our heart. Our heart is the Ark of the Covenant. Now let's talk briefly about the contents of the Ark of the Covenant. According to God's holy word, there are three items contained in the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus chapter 25, verses 10 through 22. Um, God simply stated in verse 16, And thou shalt put into the Ark of the Testimony, which I shall give thee. I said that wrong. And thou shalt put into the Ark the testimony, which I shall give thee. And in verse 21, And in the Ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. So what are the three items that God instructed Moses to place inside the Ark of the Covenant? Does anybody have any clues? Oh, Aaron's rod? You had a hand up? Manna? And you had a hand up? Ten Commandments. That's absolutely correct. So, And we're going to go through each one of these one at a time. I don't know how well this will be represented when I pull them out. We have... The Ten Commandments, I'm going to set them over here. We have the manna from heaven. Not very good, a little stale. And then we have, and it's not just, oops, it's not just called Aaron's rod. What is it called? The rod that budded. Amen, that's very good. I'm going to set that there. Y'all may not be able to see it that well. I'll try to put them back here maybe. That'll work for now. All right. So, first of all, um, in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 4, we see what's listed inside, uh, we see, if you will, like a uh, uh, table of contents for the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And the golden censer, it was not one of the original items um, ever mentioned. It came up much later. That's why I didn't list it here. Um, but let us now look inside the Ark of the Covenant and briefly examine each of these three items. First of all, in Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18, and God gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with Moses upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. So then Moses turned and went down from the mount. This is in 32 verses 15 and 16. Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides. On the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the table. So these are special tablets here. Um, but they're written on both sides. This is something that people kind of overlook a lot, but that's all right. So it has writing on both sides. So Moses received from God two double-sided tables of the testimony. But then in Exodus 32 and 19, 
As soon as Moses came nigh into the camp, that he saw the, the golden calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. Later in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 1 through, uh, and 2, Moses told Israel, At that time the Lord said unto me, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and come up unto me into the mount, and make thee an ark of wood. And I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. Now Moses is here referring, in Deuteronomy, he's referring back to Exodus 34, verses 1 through 14, uh, but I'm not going to read those. I just wanted to cover it there. But in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 5, Moses told Israel, And I turned myself and came down from the mount and put the tables in the ark which I had made, and there they be as the Lord commanded me. And according to Romans chapter 3 and verse 20, the tablets containing the Ten Commandments are a reminder that, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in God's sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So God instructed Moses to keep the tables of the testimony um, in the Ark of the Covenant to remind us of our sin and the need for our salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. No Mary, no um, sacraments as they call them, no priest, sorry, brother priest, um, but Christ alone. As well, the tables of the testimony were preserved in the Ark of the Covenant to remind us of Psalm 119, 11, the word, uh, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee, that we should likewise hide God's word in our own hearts, just as the tables of testimony were stored in the Ark of the Covenant and placed in the Holy of Holies. If the Ark of the Covenant is God's dwelling place and the tables of the testimony are in the Ark of the Covenant, then by similarly hiding God's word in our own hearts serves as the evidence and assurance of God's presence in our own lives. You should hide God's word in your heart just as God instructed the Ten Commandments to be hidden inside the Ark of the Covenant. And according to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, God's law is fulfilled in whom? our Savior Christ Jesus. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Of course, Christ Jesus could not destroy the law because according to John chapter 1, verse 1 and 14, um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of only the begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Christ Jesus is the fulfillment of God's law. But even better, Christ Jesus is also our Savior from the penalty of violating God's law. Romans chapter 6 verses 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What a blessing to know the contents of the ark of the covenant. Christ Jesus is the ark of the covenant for us. Next, in Exodus chapter 16, verses 32 through 34, God's holy word declares, And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commandeth, fill an omer of it, talking about the manna from heaven, to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness, when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein, and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. Now, I have to back up a moment. Does anyone know what the word manna means? It's a question. I mean, the word manna is actually a question. What is it? No joke. True story. Manna uh, means what is it? They didn't know what it was. So they, they, they asked, what is it? And so that's what the name stuck, I guess, you know. Um, but God, if you see, refers to it as bread. Now, this is a very interesting um, thing because, so the golden pot of manna is a reminder of God's daily provision of manna for Israel in the wilderness, sure. But God's manna was also prophetic of the true bread from heaven, which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. According to John chapter 6 and th verse 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So the manna prophesies that Christ Jesus is the bread of life. Thank God for Christ Jesus. Amen. Again, what an amazing blessing to understand the meaning of the contents of the Ark of the Covenant. 
And then finally, in Numbers chapter 17 and verse 10, And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels, and thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me, that they die not. So we read in Numbers chapter 16, verses 1 through 28, um, a story of rebellion against Moses and Aaron. Three men, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, decided that they did not appreciate Moses' leadership. As a result, God opened up the earth and swallowed up Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and all of their families, and all 250 other knuckleheads who followed Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. All of but the rest of them didn't really want to get swallowed up. Other people, they, we don't want to go in there. Um, but there was still a little bit of murmuring going on. So in Numbers chapter 17, verses 1 through 8, God instructed Moses to instruct the leader of each tribe of Israel to bring one staff of theirs with their name on it to be placed in the tabernacle. And according to no, uh, Numbers chapter 17, verse 5, And it shall come to pass that the man's rod, whom I shall choose, shall blossom, and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. The next morning it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded, and not just budded, and brought forth buds, and bloomed blossoms, and yielded almonds. This reemphasized that God selected Aaron and the house of Levi to serve God as the priesthood of God for Israel. So Aaron's rod that budded is prophetic, though, of the work of Christ Jesus as our high priest. The prophet spoke for God before man. The priest spoke for man before God. As our high priest, Christ Jesus offered himself, where he sprinkled his own sacred blood on the mercy seat in the throne room in heaven. Easter lilies, bunny rabbits, and chicken eggs, I don't care how pretty you paint them, do not speak of the resurrection. But Aaron's rod that budded does. It was just an old dead stick that God made alive and not only budded, but also brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. A dead stick that came alive. Jesus, as Christ, or, or just as Christ Jesus conquered death and hell, um, fully paying the wages of our sin debt so that we can receive eternal life everlasting with God in heaven. If that little stick there that, that, that blossomed and brought forth almonds doesn't point towards Christ Jesus, then strike me down now. Friends, this is exciting stuff. We get to see Christ Jesus in the ark of the testimony. Thank God for Christ Jesus, because according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 through 57, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Consider John chapter 11, and verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, just as that little stick bloomed as well. So Aaron's rod that budded points to our eternal life everlasting that we may obtain by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. What a blessing to learn how the Ark of the Covenant prophesied of Christ Jesus as prophet, priest, and king, and even better, our Savior. Friends, the purpose of the Ark of the Covenant was not just as an earthly dwelling place for the Creator God to commune with His creation. Even better, the Ark of the Covenant and indeed the entirety of God's tabernacle was a prophetic road map pointing us to the prophesied Messiah and our promised Savior, Christ Jesus. The Ark of the Covenant as the dwelling place of God with men was indeed a very powerful artifact, but the power did not lie within the wood overlaid with gold itself but within the God who dwelled between the cherubims. But to those people who are still seeking after the Ark of the Covenant in hopes of gaining, I don't know, maybe control over its power, and in, in answer to those people who ask me periodically where I believe the Ark of the Covenant is today, I have two things to say. First of all, even if you found God's Ark of the Covenant today, you would not find the power of God in it anymore. I've already given you the answer why. Because God no longer restricts himself to only dwelling between the cherubims. Rather, through Christ Jesus, God now dwells personally in the hearts of those who accept and receive Christ Jesus as Savior. You will not find power in the old ark because we have power through Christ Jesus in our lives. 
Praise God for Christ Jesus. And secondly, it is physically impossible to find the Ark of the Covenant here on earth until we are gathered unto our people in heaven. Because according to Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19, the Ark of the Covenant is in heaven. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in God's temple the Ark of His Testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hell. You want to ask me where it is? Open your Bible. It tells you where to look for it. It's in heaven, in the temple of God. Friends, the publican no longer need cry for mercy anymore, for God has a meeting place where publicans and sinners can come. There is a mercy seat in heaven. Men talk about committing the unpardonable sin today. There is no sin that anyone can commit today that will keep you away from the mercy seat except to reject Christ Jesus, who is the mercy seat. To remain in a condition of unbelief alone will keep you away from the mercy seat. Again, there is a mercy seat, and Christ Jesus is our mercy seat. He is our Ark of the Covenant. Do you know the mercy seat? If not, I implore you to talk to one of us today, and we will show you how you can find the true power of the Ark of the Covenant through God's holy word pointing you to Christ Jesus, our Savior. Brother, it is great to have you visiting with us. Would you mind closing out in prayer this morning, sir?